I guess. All right, so um, anybody else need handouts? Made too many, it looks like. Um, so yeah, um, after the excitement of the last lecture, today I'm going to talk about something less exciting, but um, it's, uh, it's very important. Uh, there's a lot of scientific principles that underlie um, stuff that I'll be talking about for the rest of this half of the semester. Um, and um, this has to do largely with the fact that a lot of what we are talking about involves uh, liquids interfacing with solids. And these liquids might be room temperature, they might be 200 degrees, they might be 400 degrees, they might be 1400 degrees, all right? And so we're talking about how those liquids interact with solids and primarily how we use that interaction to engineer the behavior or properties of the solids we're trying to make, like an implant, where that's really, really important, um, or else where those, those liquids in interacting with the solid did something we don't like, which then compromised the properties of the implant that we're trying to make. And so understanding some of these, these basic phenomena is um, going to be important to us. And so what I'm going to do is you know, give you a little bit of of derivation but not very much but the, the important thing that you guys need to make sure you understand and you might need to go back and listen to me go on about this more than once is the, the this basic processing issues associated with these phenomena and these are not trivial and uh, we use these to explain things that have gone wrong in many cases and um, so it's key to really understanding this and so I, I created this lecture just because I felt like well Rather than just talking about things piecemeal here and there, let's just generate a lecture, lay it all out, and then we'll use it for the rest of the, the my half of the course. Okay, so um, it's a it's a key set of concepts that that you need to know about, and especially again because it factors into manufacturing very heavily in this area. And so uh, we're talking about surface chemistry effects and processing. So we have surfaces, and as you guys know. Um, surfaces, in this case, mean solids, solids that we're trying to process into something that's a bulk material with good properties, ideally. But we're starting with powders, um, and those powders have surfaces, and those surfaces consist of broken bonds, and because the bonds are broken, the it has a higher energy associated with that interface than if it was a, a monolith without surfaces, all right, and that's part of what drives the concerns. And we also have some chemistry effects, and no, I'm not going to talk about organic chemistry, at least not today. Um, but there's issues about what is on that surface, and that surface involves a certain chemistry that's present on that surface, and those are things we need to worry about. And uh, these effects, and you know, in the end, how they affect processing. You'll see some examples of that today, and you'll see a lot more later on um, when we talk about uh, other aspects of processing and the kinds of uh, formulations people have put together to try to create these these different biomedical products. Okay. All right, so um, the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, surface tension. And um, this is something that controls a lot of the properties of uh, these materials. And uh, really, we're kind of talking about, you know, strictly speaking, surface energy, uh, surface tension, but surface energy is also part and parcel of this definition. And so we think of gamma as a term for surface energy, right? We're all familiar with that, I hope. Uh, the broad term is surface tension, but surface energy is kind of where we go with this. And this involves a change in the free energy as a function of the change in the area. And so a lot of what we do in these processes is we change the area. Uh, you guys know that already. We, we take, uh, you know, 500 meters squared a gram of powder and turn it into 0 0.005 meters squared a gram of solid product. All right. So there's huge changes in surface. Um, and so at constant pressure temperature and number of molar species held constant this is one of the, the factors that controls the energy of our system so we'll spend a little time going over where these expressions come from so for the force exerted parallel to the surface of any liquid and we're starting with the liquid here but a lot of this pertains to solid um, divided by the length of the line over which that force acts we can think of as gamma being equal to F divided by L. So rather than trying to think about surface energy, we think about mechanical force, because we have an appreciation for mechanical force. It's something that makes sense to us. 
And so in this context, then, surface tension is a property of a surface, not to be confused. If you have a mechanical engineering background, they have a concept called elastic tension, which is not the same thing as surface tension at all. Um, in our area of the woods, this comes in joules per square meters, newton per meter, millinewton per meter, dynes per centimeter. And those are the units we use to describe this property. And what's done, or what Laplace did, way back in 1632, or whenever you de derived this, is think about a surface as being represented by soap film. All right. And this is a special, this is an experiment you can do, but he did it as a thought experiment initially. And that soap film is sitting there in a, um, a wire, U-shaped wire cage. And it's connected um, to itself by the, the cage. And then there's also this movable wire with a couple of loops that hold it onto that U. Okay, so this is something you could do in 1632, right? And so you've got this soap film that sits on this movable slide, all right, and we can apply a force. And that force in being generated, it stretches that soap film just a little bit, all right? And that's going to be what we're talking about here. So what does that mean in terms of work, and how can we use that to describe the energy of these surfaces? Again, because we, we're not very good at thinking about free energy, we like to use work instead of free energy. So we then look at that gamma term, zooming back out, as opposed to this initial gamma term, as being equal to the force divided by 2L rather than a single L. Why is that? Anybody looking at the soap film? An answer for that? Anybody? The soap film has two sides. That's where the two comes from. All right, that's how they, that's how we came up with that. So rather than just thinking about a, an infinitely thin line, you actually talk about a film. And the film has two sides to worry about. And so we think about doing work on this. All right. And so as you guys have seen a, a zillion times, I hope uh, work is FDX. All right. And we can think about then um, converting that force based on this formula. And so we end up with. The, the work being done on the system is being equal to the change in the area times the, the surface energy, all right? And that is something that corresponds to what we do as process engineers, which is you know, we throw it into a furnace at 1400 degrees C. So we use thermal energy to do work on the system and change that surface area. And that's, that's another way of describing the work is the amount of electrical thermal energy put into that system. So that's the that's initial concept. Um, and that hopefully that helps you refresh the importance of, of surface energy in your mind. Do you need a handout? No? Okay. And uh, then we also start thinking about other aspects of this that start to uh, relate more um, concretely to what happens with surfaces. And we're going to start with something that's, that's not a solid surface, but uh, it gets the point across. And so what we're thinking about here is a curved surface, all right? And so we have what we consider a curved liquid film soap bubble of radius r where the pressure inside and outside is the same. Now this is not equivalent to any bubble you've ever seen because those are always sitting in an area that of compression known as atmospheric pressure and so they're not relaxed. But we start with that and if we then introduce this into a real situation, all right, it's going to have a soap bubble Anything around is trying to minimize its own surface area by shrinking, but becoming as small as possible. It's nice and round, which is good, but it would like to become smaller. And so in that relaxation, it will shrink in order to reduce the surface energy area and hence its overall surface energy, which everything likes to do. Um, doesn't matter what the temperature is. And so you're then starting from this relaxed outer state going to something that is more stressed because of the effects of the bubble shrinking and the atmospheric pressure and so forth. And so there's a shrinkage process that goes along with the change in the size of that sphere. And so we assume then it shrinks by that dr term shown over there in the cartoon, which will result in an increase in the pressure inside the bubble by dp. Okay, so right away we know that all bubbles have a higher pressure on the inside than they do on the outside. Hopefully that's not all that hard to grasp. 
And so we think about that in terms of, again, work. All right, we like the term work because we're kind of mechanically inclined to manipulate reality, um, which is a reduction in surface energy. And we can think about this as dPTV being equal to 2 times gamma, again, times dA. And so we're looking at this change in surface energy associated with that change in the overall volume and pressure. Now, this is, um, again, I mentioned Laplace earlier, and so this is all his stuff. And so he didn't have computers back in 1632. So what he did, instead of trying to solve this in three dimensions, he said, well, you know, a bubble is a, is a circle if you project it onto a wall, right? So let's look at it that way. So instead of trying to deal with delta V, he looks at the circumference formula, 2 pi r squared, and uh, this then is equal to 2 pi times 2 pi r in the context of a straightforward manipulation or the delta P being equal to 4 gamma divided by r. And so um, that's all well and good, and then what he did is simplify it a little bit further. Instead of having air inside that bubble, let's have a liquid inside that bubble. All right, which relates to us because now we're starting to say, okay, well, that liquid, we can actually think of it as a solid because that makes more sense. You only have the one interface, the outer interface of the, either liquid or solid, and we end up with change in pressure being equal to 2 gamma divided by R, or what's famously known as the Laplace equation, which you guys saw in physics at some point, maybe? Maybe, you know, Laplace? Have you ever heard the name Laplace before? Okay. <coughs> All right. Um, that is what it is. Um, physics is letting me down here. No? Physics was years ago. Even if I did see it, I wouldn't remember. <laughs> no, this the name, Laplace. It's like famous, <laughs> famous <laughs> French I scientist. I can't remember Laplace. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what day of the week it is? <laughs> That's right. Okay. We got that part. <laughs> All right. The rest of the week is a blur, but you know what Friday is. Yeah. All right. So, um, and that the reason become this becomes important is now we're going from soap bubbles and perfect spheres to real systems. And this is where this starts to become significant. Um, and the point need, uh, you make here is for a surface having more than one principal radii of curvature. Now this is kind of abstract, which means real surfaces. We can talk about radii 1 and radii 2 to describe those local radii. What the heck am I talking about here? I'm talking about the kinds of particles I've been showing you guys. So we have a particle, and this is, you know, I'm, I'm intentionally making it uglier than normal. Uh, we have this surface that consists of a non-spherical object, all right? It's not a perfect sphere. And so we have this ugly looking particle. And uh, so we'll have, you can have a radii one, and then down in here we can have a radii two, okay? And what I'm about to tell you is that those, those radii don't exist independently of each other, that they have an influence on each other. And that influence is based on pressure, um, and this is, something that's true at room temperature, but only becomes really important at high temperatures when stuff can move around. And so what we've got, and thinking, oh, come on, thinking about this, we have these relationships between these different radii of curvature on the same particle, all right? We have the use of what's called the general Laplace equation, where the change in pressure at those two R1, R2 areas is going to be equal to gamma, okay? So hopefully you, you're very comfortable with gamma at this point because we talk about it a lot, times the expression 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, all right? And so that means there rela there's a relationship, there's a change in pressure as I go from R1 to R2. And what I mean by change in pressure, I mean a change in the amount of vapor that exists in R1 and R2. And that vapor comes from whatever this particle is made up of. All right, so we're used to thinking about things like water having vapor pressure, mercury has pressure above it, solids also have pressure above them, not very much, but there's always some measurable amount of difference, or difference, there's always a measurable amount of vapor pressure above any surface. Uh, usually not very important, but we take these things, put them into a furnace at 1500 degrees C, suddenly that vapor becomes significantly different and also important in terms of driving that solid around. And so what we're saying is that vapor pressure now varies across the surface 
when the local radii vary across the surface. And to try to drive this home, I have another cartoon. So looking at that particle surface more simply, we have a very broad peak and a very broad valley. And so we have, this is R, let's call this R2. And when, I'm, when I talk about radius of curvature, I'm talking about the fact we could just draw a giant circle and that giant circle will have a radius all right, associated with it. Over here, on the other hand, this guy, we have a much smaller circus, surface, uh, sphere, and then of course a much smaller radius. All right, and so what we're gonna talk about is the fact that the vapor pressure here above this really large radius of curvature is not the same as it is at this very small radius of curvature. All right, and that drives changes in this geometry. All right? Any questions about this so far? <coughs> so we know we have different radii of curvature in these real systems. Breaking it down, we look at it simply this way. We know that the vapor pressure in one point is not the same as the vapor pressure in the other point. All right, any questions so far? Making sense? All right, and so why is this important? It's important because of transport and what happens in these solids. Differences in the vapor pressure of the atoms that are sublimi sublimating or vaporizing out of the lattice drives transport and leads to surface rearrangement. And so if you go look up the, the vapor pressure of water at 37.2 degrees uh, in a textbook or online, you'll get this P-naught value. And that P-naught value holds for a perfectly flat surface of water. Or you can look up the uh, same thing for mercury and mercury has a, a vapor pressure for a perfectly flat surface of mercury. Um, but when we talk about real solids, they're not perfectly flat, all right? And so we start thinking about something that has some of the shapes that I just kind of cartooned for you a minute ago. We think of this as a concave surface, just to try to get us all on the same page about that. And then over here, is convex. All right, and of course this is flat. All right, and so when we think about the vapor pressure above these different surfaces, uh, it turns out that the vapor pressure of whatever this solid is, is less than this equilibrium textbook vapor pressure when it's concave, and the pressure of that same solid above a convex surface is more than the equilibrium vapor pressure. All right. And so what that means, especially at higher temperatures, is that these vapors, all right, are gonna wanna move around. So the vapor pressure above that hill, that convex surface, is greater than equilibrium and certainly greater than concave. And so what that means is that this vapor over here can transport either to here or there, especially, and those atoms will now have a lower energy, all right, because they're in a happier place. <laughs> where they're not just inclined to vaporize. All right, does that make some sense? And so this is a lot of what has to do with things like sintering and behavior of various liquids. And so the, the surface curvature causes the chemical potential. All right, that's a term I know you've heard because material science teaches that one. All right, which is the propensity for these atoms to change, right? That's chemical potential. High chemical potential means they're gonna go over the curve and do something and become something else. In this context, we're talking about them vaporizing. A nanoparticles to be greater than those at the surface of some type of large uh, multi-micron particle, okay? So that means that when you have a tiny little nanoparticle, let's, you know, extreme case, it's say it's five nanometers, all right? The, um, that has a very small radius of curvature all right, and thus it's gonna have a very high vapor pressure. In fact, it's mostly surface, all right? So those atoms wanna leave and go someplace else and become part of a big particle if they can do it, all right? But, so that also means that nanoparticles, which is where we're going with biomaterials processing because we make the flaw sizes smaller that way, that becomes significant here in terms of governing their properties, especially at higher temperatures. Atoms in a region of sharp positive curvature are of higher chemical potential than atoms in that flat surface, corresponding flat surface. They want to leave and go someplace else. They don't want to be 
in these, these high energy situations where they have higher chemical potentials. And so what does that mean? First off, this applies to interfaces between either a solid and its vapor or a liquid and its vapor as well. All right, this is why this is kind of a fundamental thing because it involves liquid processing as well as solids processing. The equilibrium vapor pressure P is a function of the surface energy, we already know that, and the surface curvature, which is what we're talking about, which is given by the Kelvin equation, which is an ad adaptation. You guys have heard of Kelvin before. He adapted Laplace's work and came up with his own equation in which you're looking at this pressure and we want to know what it is, higher or lower, um, is, and the ratio of that, the log ratio of that is equal to 2 times gamma again, this uh, V sub mole, which is the molar volume of the atoms, how big they are, divided by R, all right, R again is that surface curvature, all right, so this is where if you have a nanoparticle that's, you know, 10 micron, 10 nanometers in diameter versus a microparticle that's 40 microns in diameter, we know that the vapor pressure P is going to be larger for the nano stuff than it is for the micro stuff. Okay. And so we sometimes call this the Kelvin pressure or Kelvinian pressure to recognize these differences. All right, we're clear on that so far. All right, again, this is, as I said earlier, you want to go back and think over these things. And so what does this mean? It means you'll get more rapid evaporation or dissolution, all right, which relates to liquids, of finer particles or features in regions of sharp positive curvature, i.e. tiny particles or jaggedy peaks on top of a larger particle. It also means, that I mentioned earlier, you get preferential condensation of the stuff in regions of sharp negative curvature. It means they want to fill up the concave surfaces. And the sharper the concave surfaces are, the more they want to fill them up because the pressure is lower there. And so in following what's happening, this causes smoothing of rough surfaces. And what I'm talking about here is, uh, for those of you who might remember it, stage one centering. Have you guys heard about this before? No? Yes? Yeah. I'm the only person who's ever heard of stage one centering. Okay. Um, all right, so I take a bunch of particles and I throw them into a furnace, and there's an initial stage of sintering associated with, with those, those particles as they first see the heat. And this has to do with the fact that, again, we have these real-life jaggedy particles in which the energy at the top of the hill is greater than the energy in the valley, right, in terms of the atoms that are sitting in those two locations. And so what that means is that as this thing heats up, we see what's called an, an immediate smoothing. Um, and I'm going to try to do this justice, but I can't guarantee. So we're trying to make those initial jaggedy areas smoother by causing transport from the hills to the valleys, basically. That's happening all over, and so it's smoothing these particles. And this is certainly very true of nanoparticles because they're really jagged. You know, true nanoparticles have facets, very tiny, sharp, points on them. That's the first thing that goes away when you heat these up. And that stage one centering is, is not very important in terms of getting to our goal, only 1 to 2 percent volumetric shrinkage. But it's an example of how this process can drive material behavior. Okay, hopefully that makes some sense at this point. What? That makes a lot of sense. Then. Okay. All right. Cool. Good. And things get worse in the other stages of centering, which I guess I'll have to talk about at some point. Okay. Uh, we also see, um, even hopefully more familiar, displacement of a curved phase boundary towards a center of curvature. What the heck does that mean? Um, and this is something that you guys should be very familiar with. If I have a grain. All right, that grain consists of surfaces that can be flat when everything's at nice and equilibrium, or it can be curved. And that's what we're talking about here. So now we have this, this shaped interface. I draw the other ones, I do the other ones flat, but that one's curved. All right. Um, and you guys have heard of grain growth before. Okay. And so what that means in this context, and hopefully just by looking at the shape, you know that grain boundary is moving that direction, right? 
because of the, the nature of the curvature. And so again here, we have a convex and a concave interface, and the atoms want to move out of the convex surface into the concave one, all right? And so what that means is these atoms are jumping over the grain boundary. We see the grain boundary move, what that means is atoms are jumping over it, all right, in order to get from the concave, convex surface to the concave surface. All right, so we, I know you know grain growth because we, we talk about that a lot in this department. And that's also important in these biomaterials as well. You might, we like grains to be small, all right? It'd be great if we could just turn off the process of grain growth. You'd make a billion dollars if you could do that. Um, but we try to manage it to keep the grains small so the properties are better when the grains are small. All right, and then the other aspect of this that involves similar things is capillary phenomenon. Um, and this is another relationship between a solid and a surface, except the solid now is actually a liquid, um, and has to do with the process of capillarity and making liquids move. Now, in the context of us and talking about mat materials processing, this can be um, these c this can be water. It can be organic solutions. It can be uh, very definitely polymer melts, um, which are, as it turns out, are really important in this area and how these things move around in response to their relationship with the surface upon which they sit. And so we think about, again, the Laplace equation, except that now instead of thinking about soap bubbles or solids, we talk about, in this case, LV, the liquid vapor interface, all right, and how it sits inside of a tube made of glass. And so you can do this on your own. You have a glass capillary. You stick it in the water, and you'll see this. You'll see the water moves up above the surface of the water around it, all right? And that's because there's a negative uh, wetting angle associated with water on glass, all right? And what that does is it drives a change in the pressure. And so even though this glass tube is open to the atmosphere, um, the pressure inside, oops, the pressure inside of it here this is P outside and uh, this is P inside. So P outside is greater than P inside, meaning that the liquid moves up, all right, because there's a lower pressure. It can't. It's being basically sucked up by this change in pressure. All right. Mercury, on the other hand, has the opposite effect because that wetting angle is negative. You don't need to memorize this, but you do need to know that this is important because here you see the opposite happens. The pressure on the inside is greater than the pressure on the outside. It's all connected. This is not, they're not isolated from each other. This is an open glass tube, but down here at these interfaces, the pressure is larger. And so that pushes the mercury down below the level of the surrounding mercury. Okay, so it's a localized chemistry energy effects causing obvious visual changes in what these liquids do in contact with these surfaces. And so, uh, where this really starts to become important, um, as always, not so much in tubes, but we're talking about particles, okay? And so this is a very strong force associated with changing these pressures. And so what we're talking about a lot this part of the semester is how particles in some type of suspension, liquid, what have you, uh, react in each other's presence. And so what we're really focused on here is the idea of having two particles that have some type of bridge, liquid bridge between them. It can be water, it can be polymer, it can be organic solvent, it can be um, molten glass at 1400 degrees. All of these things are liquids and all of these things have different radii of curvature. All right, and you can kind of see that here. But the important point to make is that, that the pressure inside that bridge is lower. All right, so just make sure you're clear on that. And the fact that that pressure is lower means that there's gonna be a driving force to suck these guys in, all right? Just like liquid mercury 
for example. So it draws those particles together, and we call that a capillary force. Okay. I know you've heard that term before. Uh, usually we talk about transport of liquids, but this is liquids transporting solids, or at least causing them to move. And so this is significant to us as people who are trying to design and fabricate microstructures, because if we have a structure of particles and this black stuff is a liquid surrounding or infiltrating these particles, we can, in the far left-hand case, the what's called the pendular state, it's a fun word, um, you have these bridges between them and each of those bridges is going to exert a negative force. And so what that means is you can have things happen like you know, this particle, uh, let me see if I'll make this particle rotate and fall into that space because of those negative forces. Those negative forces can move the particles th themselves around. All right? And so for us, it means we're going from one microstructure to a different one. And in fact, if this occupies space better, good. Our flaws are smaller now. We like that. When we want it to happen, we like it. Does everyone kind of see that? These negative forces, you know, it's not a perfectly square lattice, so things are imbalanced. And they start pulling on each other, and you can cause rotation and shifting of particles. Uh, the other side of this, um, the capillary state, which is a confusing name, we have continuous liquid, all right? There's no bridges. There's no negative capillary forces developing. This guy is going to be stable. It's not going to do anything, because you don't have that, that, that tiny bridge in which side you get in which you get the negative forces in the middle okay any questions about that so these liquid bridges develop there's a negative pressure inside of them it's just it is what it is thanks to Laplace and Kelvin we get that happening and it, it causes things to move around okay so consequences I have the talk more about these but what that means is for two spheres or think of two particles whether the microparticles or nanoparticles with a that pendular bridge a compressive stress occurs in the contact region at its highest level and wetting is strong meaning that the liquid likes the solid and the volume of liquid is small meaning that there's lots of space except in the neck region and that neck region is occupied by liquid this can cause as I've shown you particle sliding and rotation meaning that the microstructure can change. Um, we're not exerting any mechanical force on it. We're letting or we're either letting or suffering from the fact that these capillary forces can move the particles around and translate them to closer contact and higher densities, all right, which is sometimes good, not sometimes not good. Um, so I want to show you this little video from our, our welding brethren. Come on. No, I don't want you to do that. All right, I'll do it this way. It's supposed to be able to slide it. And so this is uh, just a nice example. All right, so this is a guy who's welding. They're, they're brazing stuff, all right? So they like silver brazes and try to steal pipes with it and stuff like that. And he's giving us a nice example of what this means. We don't care so much about that, but we, we so Let's this is, conduct, whoops, conduct. come on, for stop. All right, so this is showing you two glass slides with a 0 0.381 millimeter gap caused by the presence of that little film of copper, okay? And he's got a gem clip holding them together on the other side. And so what you're looking at is this, this particular film of copper sitting here at the edge. Up here it goes to zero, and from here to there, there's a you know, really skinny triangle, okay? So everyone see that? What? I don't actually do it. It's two glass slides held together by a gem clip at one end, and it's clamping down on this copper film on the other end. So there's a copper film, it's a spacer, and then that space is shrinking as we move up toward the gem clips. Got it? All right, so this is going to be a great example of capillary forces. So he's going to take this and dunk this into this liquid, relatively thick liquid. For capillary action to occur. Now let's see what happens no. when we dip the bottom into a tray of liquid. As you can see, the liquid is drawn up smoothly by capillarity to fill the entire clearance between the plates. 
This illustrates the value of a close and uniform you clearance for successful too, capillarity the during brazing. Clips, the space is Next, we'll demonstrate what will happen okay. when we don't. So for these guys, they're saying, oh, well, that's, we want the silver brace to fill even the tiniest cracks and all the small spaces so that the, the joint is complete. But you know, they rely on capillarity. And when we talk about these different materials that are being processed with particles, whether it be metal particles or ceramic particles, capillarity is also at work. So if you can transport up this slide, you can certainly transport between a few particles that are located close by. And this is how redwoods work. That's why redwoods grow so tall, is they rely on capillary forces to draw water, you know, whatever it is, 300 meters into the air. I forget how tall redwoods are. Is it, is it 300 meters? Could be. Anyway, probably not, but uh, anyway. 300 meters would be, would be pretty tall. It's more, probably more like 300 feet. Anyway, so that's, that's an example of capillarity at work when these these forces exist and they can draw liquids around. So not only can they pull things together, but they can also cause liquids to move. And so in the context of dealing with these solids that we're about to start describing, uh, we can think about how this influences, again, microstructure. Um, and this is showing you, and we'll come back to this later, but this is giving you an example of uh, what's called a green body. Um, and this is something that is uh, a terminology you have to get used to. So green body is not something that's colored green. It's green because it's, it's, it's the initial state. It's the first form state. And so this is just showing you a bunch of boring looking particles that have been compacted together. And it's then heated up. And this gray stuff here is some type of liquid. And in most cases, it's a polymer liquid polymer-based liquid. So polymer-based liquids are going to become really important in talking about these processes later on. And so you start out where everything is, looks like this, and then we start heating it up. And what's happening is the polymer is starting to break down and turn into a gas and leave. All right. At the same time, however, it's, it's becoming a liquid. And so what, what that means is that capillarity can cause this liquid to finger up into these regions where there's the possibility of forming bridges. And so the, this is called capillary transport, and it can move liquid around, and in doing so, form these tiny bridges and cause these particles to get pulled together or cause them to rotate. All, right, all these things are happening because of these forces of capillarity. All right, they're obviously very, very strong forces in this context. If it works for redwoods, it'll work for our tiny little compact, okay? So everyone see that? All right, negative pressures caused by geometry, caused by surface energies, and caused by the wetting angles, essentially, between these liquids and the surfaces on which they sit. OK. Any questions about that before we go on? You know, again, these are, these are all kind of fundamental concepts that factor into a lot of different aspects of processing. And one of the ones that some of you at least are familiar with is van der Waals forces. And of course, you should all be familiar with that because we talk about that in chemistry in 2010 and something else probably. But anyway, in polymers, we talk about it a lot because we talked about forces between polymer chains, whether it's dispersion forces or hydrogen bonding. You guys have heard of hydrogen bonding before, right? And these, these forces exist at the surface of all solids, all right? Not just polymers, but all solids are going to be characterized by van der Waals forces. And this is because we have these fluctuating dipoles that sit there at those interfaces that make up those surfaces. And they're not very happy atoms, right? Because their bonds are broken. They'd rather be someplace else. They'd rather be safely buried away inside the bulk where their energy is lower. But no, we force them to the surface, and they're not happy about it. Part of this is driven by this attraction constant, all right? And that attraction is the inherent energy of the atoms at that interface and um, the fact that they are, they are atoms and they're going to have their own characteristic van der Waals forces whether they're in a solid or not. All right, So atoms interact with each other based on either dipoles or hydrogen bonding. Um, and we have a way of describing that quantitatively for two small, quote unquote, less than 40 micron particles. It's not really that small in the scheme of things. We have a diameter A for those particles, and we have what's called the potential energy of attraction U sub A. 
and this is at a separation h which is characteristically much much less than a this formula gives us information about that energy of attraction so we have this constant a i'll talk about in a second capital a i'm sorry too many too many of the same letters over and over and then we have a itself which is the diameter and then very importantly we have h which is the separation and so you notice that h is in the denominator so as h gets very small whoops come back as h gets very small u gets very large all right the smaller the distance the larger u becomes so as these particles get closer together this number starts getting very large all right, so I, I know I mentioned the energy well concept. This is that energy well in action. What's lowercase? Oh, never mind. Lowercase h or a? A, I got it. Okay. All right, and so if we think about it in terms of force, which of course, because that's how kind of how we're set up, we think about force. All right, the force of attraction, instead of just that u sub a, is equal to the same thing, except now it's h squared, which makes it even worse. All right, and so we th this is how we think about particles falling into the energy well. That energy well being driven by the local attractive forces and this relationship. So as H becomes infinitesimally small, F of A becomes infinitely large. All right, and so that attractive force causes them to be pulled together. And we talked about Brownian motion last time. That's another thing at work here that causes them to get close together. Brownian motion drives them to the point where H becomes very small. And then this force takes over and slams them into each other and in many cases never lets go. Okay. Any questions about that? You believe that? We're good with it? That's, this is nothing unusual. Uh, we also have as I mentioned briefly, this thing called the Hamaker constant. And this is a function of both the particles and whatever medium it's in. So if I take particles and I put them into, let's see, I used to say benzene, but no one works with benzene anymore. So I put them in hexane, which people still work with. All right, those particles are going to get drawn into that energy well more easily than if I put them into water. All right, water is a better processing solvent than benzene because of the nature of the relative Hamaker constant. Okay, turns out organic solvents are pretty awful places to try to do some of the process work. Water's better if you can do it. And as we'll talk about, we talked about before, and we'll talk about later, polymers are even better than, than that, but for different reasons. But, so these, these different Hamaker constants uh, have to do with how, um, how strong these agglomerative forces are. All right, so, and it could be just air. We can think of air as being the medium in which agglomeration occurs. And we talked about that last time too, where the particles form these ugly agglomerates because the Hamaker forces take over and pull them into each other. All right. These same forces of attraction that can pull particles into each other can give rise to molecular affinities as well. If they can pull solids together, they can also pull molecules together, which happens all the time when we talk about polymers themselves. Atoms and molecules at these surfaces have unsatisfied chemical bonds, as I've said many times before, that produce a surface tension, and the net energetics of these unsatisfied chemical bonds can be favorably affected by adsorption of molecules, gases, molecules, liquids, polymeric species, whatever happens to be in the neighborhood, it gets drawn into and sits on that surface. Okay, quick side note, What's the difference between absorption and adsorption? Anybody have a clue? All right, so um, a sponge absorbs things into its solid. The bounty, the quicker picker upper, absorbs liquids into the, the fabric of the, the paper towel, the cellulose. That's absorption. Adsorption with a D is just on the outside, all right? <laughs> And it's re really important, so please don't, if I give you a question about adsorption and you write absorption, the red pen comes out. All right, so don't do that. Make sure you know the difference between them. So adsorption is just sitting on the outside, not going in at all. That's ab, A-B? Ab, ab, A-B. Absorption is a sponge, but adsorption is just surface. That's A-D. A-D, yeah, exactly. Everybody clear on that? Okay, 
And so, because there's a reason for it, because the atoms, both the whatever's being adsorbed and the solid surface itself, want this to happen, it does. And so what you'll see in uh, many cases, so if I, I, I uh, take a solid and I form it in the hard vacuum of outer space and then I bring it in to Earth, all right, one of the first things that will happen is that a, a layer of something will show up, and in many cases this can be water. Uh, and we can also have what's called, as you can see here, a nice monolayer. And so what happens is, on ceramics especially, uh, water molecules will show up and they'll pack just like this. They'll have a cl close packed structure sitting on that surface. And uh, the density of water on the surfaces is actually greater than water in, in a liquid because it's so well packed, it's organized. All right? And so it's a higher density liquid sitting on that surface because of the, how much it likes that surface. And then after that, um, those attractive forces are, are not zero here. They still are greater than zero. So other water molecules will show up and they'll sit on top of those, but the attractive forces are not as strong. So they're more loosely held, maybe not as ordered, but it still happens. All right, and this is common for all ceramics. A lot of what we'll, lot of what we'll talk about involves ceramics, as well as metal particles, which have oxide layers on their surfaces. And so they also attract water to themselves. And so this is what we as process engineers have to worry about. We need to get rid of this stuff because we don't want to make water-based biomaterials. We want to make solid biomaterials. So we have to think about this. Um, adsorption can be monolayer in nature. It can also be multi-layered in nature. Um, and we can use this so if you make the sample surface TiO2, all right, then you can actually see the electrical response of water being absorbed onto these surfaces and use it as a moisture sensor. You go up to any glove box around here, the moisture sensor is based on titanium dioxide and how much it likes water. All right. And so this is something that we know about and we use and we have to deal with as process engineers. Any questions about that? Hopefully that, that, that makes some sense, that, that these forces exist, and they can, besides drawing particles together very, very strongly, they can also draw in atoms, both liquids, gases, and molecules as well. And so these polar liquids, i.e. water, which I've already talked about, can be both physically and chemically adsorbed onto oxide surfaces. Uh, metal oxide and metal or oxide particle surfaces are all subject to this and we have a couple of different categories of this one of which is the uh, kind of thing we've been talking about physical adsorption or sometimes called physisorption and so we have some type of metal oxide surface underneath it, it might be metal underneath it might be oxide could be a nitrate could be all kinds of things but the surface itself is oxidized water shows up sits down on it, starts forming monolayers on its surface, all right? We also have another feature, which is called chemical adsorption or chemisorption. So again, it's not going in, but it's sitting on the surface. Water shows up, but and now it reacts with this bond and makes a hydroxide or hydroxylate, depending on how you will look at it. All right, and so this is something that can happen spontaneously. And so when we turn around and turn this into a solid or try to, we have to deal with the consequences of the fact that water is on the surface or hydroxy surface, hydroxy species are sitting on that surface. They have to be gotten rid of. All right. So this is all part of what happens when we put things into a furnace. <coughs> Any questions about that? All right. Last slide. So. The presence of the metal hydroxyl groups on the oxide surfaces causes it to physically absorb several additional layers of polar water molecules, all right? And um, as I mentioned earlier, the physically bonded water is immobilized and is of a different structure than bulk water. It can be higher density than bulk water, and then above that surface it can be lower density than bulk water. And because water is present, other things in the environment like water, all right? Now, I'm, I'm picking on water because it is one of the fastest absorbers on these surfaces, but, you know, formic acid or fingerprint oil, 
all kinds of things will absorb to these surfaces as well. There's no reason we have to pick on water, it's just that water is the ubiquitous thing. But everything will absorb to these surfaces. Whoa. And we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about surface characterization um, in which you take these same particles and you put them into what's called a BET analyzer and you adsorb nitrogen onto the surfaces at low temperatures and that can be used to tell you how much surface area you have. All right. It's all based on monolayers of gas molecules in that case as opposed to just water. We also have alcohols and liquids, especially those containing carboxylate groups, can be chemiabsorbed onto these oxide surfaces. And so this is sometimes a bad thing. Um, a difference between water and alcohols and uh, carboxyl groups is that these guys have carbon in them. All right. And so I talked about a little bit earlier how carbon changes the properties of these, these materials we're making. Uh, in many cases, we might want that carbon to be there because it makes carbides or properties go up. And in the case of ceramics, we absolutely don't want the carbon there because we're not making any carbides in these, these structures. Carbon is a bad thing for ceramics for the most part. Metals, it can be a good thing. But these can be chemisorbed onto the surfaces. And um, this is something that we can make use of. And we'll talk about this later. If we have our oxide surface, whatever it is, and again, you know, there can be a metal down here as well beneath that oxide layer. And then let's go ahead and admit that we have some water sitting on that oxide layer. All right. H2O sitting on that surface. And um, so this is kind of what we're dealing with. Um, and we want to think about integrating this with a polymer film around it or a molten polymer around it, what we can do is work with these carboxylate structures. And those of you who haven't seen this before, this is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. And then there's a hydroxyl group bonded to the carbon as well. And then there's stuff out here, which we'll talk about in a second. Four bonds to carbon. But these guys, they like water, all right? OH and water, they're good because they're like each other, all right? And so there's an attraction going on between these species and the water surface. These are polar bonds with a polar liquid. We can get together and form hydrogen bonds, right? One of the, strong, the strongest van der Waals bonds known to man are, are hydrogen bonds. And so this will draw in this carboxylate to the surface and bind it there. And what we do is, rather than just saying whatever, what we can do is we can engineer a polymer out here. All right, and that polymer can be 100 carbons long. We can make whatever we want, bond to this carboxylate, and then we bond that to the surface of the particles, and now we have a processing additive that controls the behavior of those particles based on this adsorption phenomena. Okay? So everyone kind of see that? We'll talk more about this, but this is another example of adsorption and why it's so important. Okay, thermal history and prior hydration of the surface are important factors influencing this process and the efficiency of the process as well. Okay, that was a lot. Any questions about that? All right, so like I said at the beginning, you make sure you, you understand and are familiar with these concepts, at least at some high level, because I'm going to start zooming through the rest of the class, and I'll come back to these things and wave my hands, but then when I ask you a test question, you need to know what these things are, all right, how they work and why they're important, where they come from. You don't need to derive anything, God no, but you need to know what they are, what these forces are, all right? So make sure you're familiar with that. All right, so see you guys on Monday, right? All right, you guys have a good weekend.